for me too. Is that a safe bet to, to do yeah, that? Yeah, may as well. I mean, we will have you through Zoom, but it compresses the fuck out of it. So if we have even something slightly- Okay, it's about to go live, just so you know, in terms of squares. You may need to adjust your volume again, Chaz. Down, it's on like 8% or something. Oh, right, okay. Must be just Zoom naturally boosting it. Oh, cool, I've got the link. Ah, oh, damn it. Okay. Uh, okay. Link tree. Ugh. I'm so cramped here compared to being in the studio. <sighs> now, enable link link. 24 hours. Cool. Uh, does anyone want to check the yeah, link? I've already, got, I've already got it open. It's wing slide. Okay, wing. it's about to go live, just so you know. In terms of yeah. We're there. All right, cool. So we'll give it a few minutes for people to join us, if anyone joins us. <laughs> Chris can go. It was nice that the AWG was promoting us. Were they? Yeah, they shared it on Facebook. Oh, how's that? So are you going oh. to put up the uh, the, the graphic? graphic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. People Which button do I right? press now? So <laughs> many, so many. I got like two mice here and two keyboards and, <laughs> and things. It's, it's... Are you recording on GarageBand? Me, yeah, I started a while ago. Okay. I'm recording as well. Uh, uh, I can't even, oh, oh, yep, there you can. Wow, this is, this is fun. We're out of, out of practice, everyone. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> I'm way out of practice. That's not even in a PowerPoint. I'm just literally playing a QuickTime in QuickTime player and looping it. That's that's us right now. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> As uh, Chris pumped out the... Uh, the tweet has gone out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's people. I know. <laughs> I just got a message saying you guys are live already, FYI. And it's like, yes, <laughs> We are just unfortunately, so <laughs> unfortunately, the way this is set up, we have to go live in order to get the link to tell people where to find us. So uh, there's no any kind of staging process with the cheap ass Zoom setup that we've got. But it sounds like we got people tuned in. Um, so do the um, the I don't think on the live stream the graphic isn't coming up. It's come up on the Zoom meeting, but not. No, on it's it's there. It's just just remember, there's like a thirty second delay. Okay. Felt like it was more than 30 seconds ago, but all right. No, it's here. I can, I can see it on my little iPad. Okay. All right. See? All right. All right. All right. All right. So does this mean we can officially start? I think so. Um, I'll, I'll start. I think you're better at, at introducing this particular topic. Hi, everyone that's tuned in. It's, we're out of practice, if you haven't noticed. All right. Well, do you want to stop? Screen sharing and we'll- I already have. Oh, all oh, right, sorry. I've got to stop looking at the live stream. Um, hi, I'm Chaz Fisher. And I'm Stu Willis. And welcome to Draft Zero, a podcast where two Aussie filmmakers try to work out great screenplays work, except work out great. we're not. <laughs> we're trying to work out how to sell uh, screenplays. And we are joined by uh, an Australian director living in LA, Mark Fermi, uh, to the show to talk us about pitch decks and lookbooks and kind of approaches to uh, buying. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you. Happy to be here, guys. I'm a huge fan of the show, have been for a while, and uh, it's, it's a bit surreal. I <laughs> know, it's, it's great to have you. So to, to give a little bit of context, um, this started, I've been aware of your work for, I'll, I'll, I'll put more of the context for you. Um, been aware of your work for a long time. You started in music videos and did commercials and you've made a feature called Terminus. You made a web series that was very prophetic called uh, Event Zero about a <laughs> biological virus. 
Um, and you then move to Los Angeles. And what's been interesting to me watching your career is that kind of awareness that for a lot of us who come outside of the Hollywood system, you've kind of had to learn how to sell your material to um, studios in the US. And you put a post out on Facebook, which was very generous of you saying, hey, filmmaker friends, um, you know, I'm interested in giving feedback on people pitch documents and stuff. And that's why we decided to do this podcast because it's like, let's reach a wider audience. Because at the moment, I think um, people, one, there's a lot of development going on, but also, uh, you know, it, the competition for, for, for selling material is fierce. Am I wrong in thinking that? <laughs> no, I think, I think now it is literally the only thing anyone can do. So it's, it's like a, a tirade of, of development. Uh, deals you can see you can see the things that are being sold on all the movie sites uh, all the press releases that are coming out daily there's a, just a lot of material that's being it's being sold and I, I don't know if it's if it's residual from the back end of the market but for instance like hearing uh, the new MGM Mike DeLuca run MGM uh, their top executive is, was talking about just how they're they're literally in a buying frenzy right now so now is the time for people who uh, are looking to sell their projects or package their projects or get their projects so finely tuned that it's irresistible to the market. Now is the time to, to do that, for sure. So what kind of, I get, let's, let's start with some definitions, I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, cause I, I had, we had, we had a pre-call about this as we did. And it's like, what is the difference between a pitch deck and a lookbook, <laughs> you know, like I, I've kind of used the terms interchangeably uh, and an American, the, like the Aline Brosh McKenna of, of Draft Zero, um, Mel was like, she's an American. So she was like, oh no, no, a pitch dick is this. She was very specific. Um, what's your experience been like being an Australian moving to, I don't want to, sorry, this is sounding a little bit like an interview, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's um, I mean, when I moved, I, I hadn't heard the term pitch deck before. Um, I mean, I thought that was something corporate people used, you know, <laughs> putting together uh, business plans. Or um, uh, yeah, I, I'd only heard like a vision vision board, or lookbook, or uh, treatment. You know, I guess coming from advertising primarily, in music videos, we 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 throw the term treatment around, but because feature film and, and long form owns that term for a different purpose, it's hard to to use that for a visual um, presentation. But what I quickly learned was that a pitch deck was, you know, uh, the broadest term for the document that goes out from producers to buyers or, or from directors to producers. Um, when initially selling the project or pitching the project. Um, and, it, and, it, and it includes basically an overview of the project um, and, and the story, it's, it's heavily story-based. Um, but then a lookbook tends to be um, either a, a briefer document um, that is the work or the author, authorship of the director um, trying to sell the vision uh, behind, behind the project. Um, and that often is, is just a, mood, a series of mood boards or a breakdown of the creative approach of, of directing, whether it's from style and mood and tone through to cinematography, sound, music, and, and all that, and even casting. Um, but yeah, lookbook is, um, you know, these, these terms are quite interchangeable, but I think the most formal term is the pitch deck, and that seems to be the one that's being used most readily by executives. So I, I, I guess what I'm picking up and I'm putting in the back of my mind is that, um, a pitch deck is definitely more formal, like maybe, and I've put pitch to get what, what I now would consider a pitch deck that's got like budget information and casting and distribution and a little bit more of the business as well as the creative. That's and right. I may supply and it may reuse some of the material from the lookbooks. So if I've got concept art done, we'll put the concept art in the pitch deck to break it up. But the look and, and but the lookbook will be more uh, extensive in terms of um the vision of the project. I mean, one way to define it might be that the pitch deck is what the producer uses to sell the project and the mm. lookbook is what the director uses to, mm. to sell the project. Well, given, can I just take a second to orient us somewhat? Because yes, I'm sure that's absolutely right. But I imagine a lot of our 
listeners who are uh, like myself, aspiring, emerging, paid every now and then to be a screenwriter. I am now feeling the pressure on myself. Like up until recently, I was like, all right, I'll sell my idea and my script to a producer and the producer, perhaps in collaboration with the director will go away and put these visual materials together to go and take the project out to market. So I've never had to, like I've obviously reviewed and had inputs on these visual sales materials, but I've never had to sort of generate them myself. But now, and I, I say this for the benefit of our listeners who are perhaps in my boat, I'm getting much more the feeling from even though those first step buyers that they want more than a log line, a script, a one page synopsis. They want more than a text based sales materials uh, and they want those things in very short digestible things and or it's not so much that they want them it's just that they're getting them and your ability to make your idea and your material stand out is a lot harder if you haven't done something visual to it is that your experience over there mark yeah, absolutely i mean the average person these days has the attention span of a sun-dried peanut. So <laughs> that doesn't even take into account the, the fact that they are busy executives or busy producers. I mean, even us at Resistor, which is our, our company, like we're a startup, but we've already, we're already getting sent a whole bunch of material. Um, and it, and it's, it's just impossible to, to go through it all um, in an expedient amount of time. And the best way to, you know, filter out um, that material is to, is to have a brief overview of the project first. And the, the more um, attractive that overview is, um, the more likely we are to read the script. So it, it, if, if you're a writer and you've written a script, if you can put a pitch deck together, you're probably going to beat out 70% of, the comp of your competition, you know, um, and then if you can do other things on top of that, like even, even as there, there's so many different ways that people are pitching materials now. I mean, what, what used to be the crowdfunding video has now become <laughs> the, the pitch that's going out because people can't meet in person. So filmmakers, writers, people are literally filming themselves, pitching, um, pitching the, the concept, and then they're into cutting themselves talking because really you're selling yourself at the end of the day if you're a filmmaker, not so much a writer. Most of, most of us writers like to hide in caves and not get much fighting. Um, e, but, you know, it's like uh, the, the, the more you can cut through the, the crowd with uh, a visual piece, um, the easier it's going to be for you to get noticed, you know. I mean, I, just to, to launch into some visual material, and, and I think we'll come back to this, but what, because for those who don't know, I also very part-time lecture in motion design and my students have to pitch what their major pro projects are. And I'm like, this is a great opportunity. Don't just phone it in to learn how to pitch because the pitch is the pitch. You can pick up so much tone and material. So what I want to share um, is the, and this will possibly this into discussion of features versus television, uh, the lookbook, well, it's actually the Bible for what became Stranger Things, right? And if and I don't want you don't even have to look at the text, right, to get a sense of the tone of this project, right? I reckon if this landed on your desk, you would flick through it and go, okay, I'm either interested in this style of show or I'm not. And I think what's interesting about it, this book is this is the show that they made right? Without reading it, just by looking at it, this is what they made. They actually, you know, they wrote, this was like the, the promise that they were able to keep or, yeah. or the check that they're able to write. And I think, I mean, even if you look at like the contact sheet here, you know, like just the way it's laid out. And so this is, I mean, they're pitching themselves as directors as well, but yeah. I think, you know, the pitch is the pitch, a boring written document. I mean, it can like, I hand in that stuff to like, the Writers Guild and all that stuff all the time, but visual material can elevate or give an indication of tone for something that is a visual medium, 
you know, mm. and I think it's very easy to forget when we're stuck in like development hell um, <laughs> of our own projects, just to think of it as words on a page as opposed to it having a visual language. And when we break down Holocode, so in this episode where Chaz and I are actually going to share one of our um, documents that Mark has given us feedback earlier. So we're going to show an earlier d- d- version and then the version that I've worked on that Mark hasn't seen. Um, but it's actually part of your development process. And having worked in animation, that kind of look development and story development goes hand in hand. And I think at some point um, we decouple that stuff in the industrial process of saying, oh, they're, they're screenwriters. But having mood boards and stuff as part of writing, I think can inform what you're trying to do. Um, and the story logic and the spatial logic and also kind of the aesthetic, you know, the aesthetic may not cut through. And as we'll talk about with Holocode, um, sometimes you'll do the lookbook and go, oh, maybe this isn't as a interesting aesthetic as it could be. And that we need to write some visual stuff into the script and then have the lookbook uh, or the pitch deck support what we're trying to do there in terms of the look. Yeah. I mean, it's just it, out there, so hmm. that's, that's what it's about. It's about, it's about finding a way to have your project noticed. And even if it is a coming of age drama, there, there is a lot you can do to, to attract the producer to read the material. Yeah. And that, that's where we're at. I mean, like going, just seeing that Stranger Things pitch or Bible or it's whatever it's it was. The, it's it officially was, their Bible. Yeah. <laughs> well, the fact that you're not sure is good. Like yeah. they're using the Bible as an opportunity to pitch the show. But it was very simple. It was the same materials that we're putting together for any Bible, for any show, like tone, theme, characters, da, 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 da. But they've just interspersed each one with a frame from a film, you know, doing a little bit of nice artwork to make it look like it's a folded up old faded magazine, but nothing too dramatic. And just in case there's any people out there who are like me, who are not very good with visual stuff or uh, like um, get freaked out by trying to do new things. One of the things that we in the pre-conversation committed to is we're only going to talk about things that we can do for free with free software. So um <laughs> well, it's kind of slightly <laughs> biased if you're running we're gonna we're basically gonna be talking about this the bible that we're showing is done uh in pages because it's got a page layout mode right and i'm sure you could actually do something similar in powerpoint if you're on pc not that that's free um you know something that's got decent page layout capabilities if you want to a there are designers out there that you can approach um that will do much better better jobs and I'm sure Mark mm. can talk to that but I think even now having a bible I know we got interest when we talk about uh, Holocode from that uh from that bible alone that people will look at it first if you give them visual material they'll look at mm. it first it's like a trailer like mm. the fact is a lot of us even like oh I don't want to see the trailer because there's pre-awareness but most of the time we pre-select what we're going to watch at the cinemas what we're going to invest two hours of our time in based on the marketing material and, and in a way, what we're creating here and talk about is creating marketing material to convince people to spend two hours or more reading a script. Because if it's a bad script, I mean, look, if it's a bad script, they'll probably bail out early. <laughs> and if it's a good script, they'll be really excited and continue with it. Uh, and and it, But most scripts probably sit in between, right? Where it's not like it's a chore, but it's not like this effortless, like, wow, that two hours, I had a great time and that two hours flew by, right? So in a way, it's, it's how do I create material that um, and and I guess that's why. Well, that is. It's not. I guess it's why you're here, Mike, to kind of give us that feedback to like help optimize that stuff. Because it's like, where do I start? You know, what should I be conscious of? And you know, and and we should talk about it now because I brought up strange Stranger Things. You know, what is the difference between like pitching a TV show versus a um, and I'm using TV show in the broad sense. You know, like a series whether it's streaming or web or whatever versus a feature you know so maybe we should start there and then we can kind of work a little bit more broadly yeah. on the evolution of your style and start showing some pickies absolutely um so you want to talk about the difference between features and, and tv shows pitching the two of those or let's start with just tv and, and features okay. yeah I mean, i've only actually pitched one television show but I pitched it successfully. So I have a one for one. hundred percent. hundred percent. Unfortunately, I haven't made, had the opportunity to make mistakes in TV land yet. Um, but I will be through this season uh, because we have about three or four things lined up. 
but um, from from what I can tell you from my experience, and I won't be able to mention too many names, but the production company that I went into um, to pitch this this show concept, which is a, a period piece, um, um, I went in with nothing, no script, nothing. It was a general meeting, and but I had. Um, I had a, a couple of historical books about this particular subject, um, which was like a, an unsung um, group of, uh, uh, of people in history that did, did something unusual. Uh, and I had a, a few public domain his, history books uh, in, on my shelf, was going to visit this company, had no idea what, uh, what I was going to pitch them, but suddenly that just jumped out to me as something they might like. I basically, swooped all the books off my bookshelf into my backpack and went for the meeting and then laid the books out on the coffee table during the meeting and, um, and pitched them this concept. And what I did after sort of attracting their attention to the concept was, was um, convince them to let me go away for a few months and work up a pitch that they could then review. So I went away and um, I did a massive Bible, like, cause the only thing I knew about Bibles was those sample Bibles, like the Stranger Things one that you pull off uh, off the internet, um, and they're they're all so different, you know, um, from the Stranger Things one, which is you know it's a it's kind of a brief overview to if you look at a proper Bible like the David Simon's uh, Bible for the Wire, it's it's <laughs> it's a Bible, <laughs> it's a Bible, yeah. um, and so I didn't really know, I didn't really have a format. So I kind of had to figure it out myself, but I, I guess I, I looked at the low, the common denominator between each of these pitch decks I was finding in, you know, uh, series overview, um, characters, um, mood and tone. And I just threw it all in the, against the wall. And the first deck was like 50 pages long. It had, you know, potential season stories and, and just had way too much material. <laughs> Um, but the producers were kind enough to actually go spend a couple of months with me workshopping um, that pitch and helping me to strip stuff out uh, and come to this point where the ultimate pitch that they would then use to sell the project was represented a distillation of, of what the key concept was. And, and I, can, I can tell you that what was in that was, was fairly broad but so like broad in the, in the plot sense, but so specific in the tonal sense that anyone that would have seen that document would have just immediately got what the show is about. And I guess where we ultimately ended up was probably not too dissimilar from the Stranger Things one you just illustrated. You know, a very, uh, it's more about the world, I think, when you're selling a TV show. It's about the world and the characters. Um, and, you know, your, log, your character never really completes a journey in a TV show. So ultimately it's about a premise, a world and characters. And I think those are the three most important things. And, and I guess when you're dealing with something historical, uh, one interesting thing that we put together in, in, in that deck was I created a, a timeline using Photoshop, like a, a paradigm of the years that the show takes place. You know, um, for instance, Mad Men, late fifties to early sixties season mm -hmm. one, you know, um, and I just put all the key historical events that happened through that, that period so that people could get a cross section of, oh, so this is happening in the background of this, of this world that, could, that these characters could tie into. Um, and, and that seemed to be really effective and that got them across the line. So I think, I didn't think there were any hard and fast rules for a TV pitch. I will say that it's whatever you do for your pitch deck for your TV series needs to be extremely organic to your concept. And, and I will show you, um, you know, some very distinct examples. Do you want to pull some up now or <laughs> let's do that. Uh, can hijack our, our zoom. Yep. Uh, so I just click share screen. Or... Yep. And, and the document, this is, I've learned this the bad way. Don't just share the desktop. Oh, uh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna hide those. Hide that, you know. I've cleared my um, desktop of any incriminating evidence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, okay, so for instance, this show, um, 
which is called. Um, oh, that's my, that's ours. Yes, cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll just go full screen. But this show is called Black Doll. Um, I hope the uh, my co-creators don't mind me sharing this. <laughs> but this series is about, um, based on historical events, it's about a, uh, a young uh, Oxford-educated Indonesian um, who returns to his homeland with his American wife and becomes embroiled um, in, in, a, in a plan to protect his country's major natural resource, oil, from the CIA from corrupt people in his own country uh, um, and, and uh, ends up becoming a foreign oil baron in a, in a, during, during the Cold War uh, in the late, late 60s, early 70s. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult show to pitch because it's, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, there are white people in this show, but they're not, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's a very um, specific cultural, culturally mm -hmm. diverse show. Um, about a, a milieu that is not America. <laughs> so, um, so what we've done here is we've, we've begun with a log line, you know. Um, I mean, the cover really sets the tone, you know, uh, that it really is about oil um, and it's about the corruption of oil. I mean, that image is stolen straight out of Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. Yeah, I, but it took me a moment. And I, it legitimately, I looked at it and was like, ooh, it feels familiar. And I think this is maybe a good reference for um, the, yeah. the rule of thumb. It feels familiar, but different. Like yeah. it, it took me a while to go, it's a girl for dragon tattoo. So it, it didn't go, the, unlike in, in the mood for love, but that's just because I love Christopher Doyle. Yeah, and, exactly. and I mean, look, often it's about how you frame an image. I mean, you might grab a, a, a still, you know, and, and let's just preface by saying the pitch, pitch decks are made from other people's material unless you, you have a ton of money and you're going to go and photograph mm -hmm. and Photoshop and retouch mm -hmm. and create all your material that's going to go in your pitch deck. And, and it's possible that you can, but ultimately people in Hollywood are pitching stuff with other people's material. And the reason you, you'll get away with that is because it's only going to be seen privately, you know, Except to this YouTube. <laughs> exactly. I'll be uh, looking forward to the uh, season. Well, just looking at the, the Stranger Things one, they were crediting every frame that they were using. Yeah. They made it look their own and made it yeah. feel like their own thing, but they were upfront and acknowledging. That Which is interesting. It's an interesting choice. I think it kind of probably fit into that. Like, oh, it's ET. It's a bit mm -hmm. ET. It's a bit... Uh, you know, fire started. It's a bit, in a way, it was them doing their comps. You know, I mean, for a show that is so such a an homage, such a piece of nostalgia porn, it helps. But anyway, sorry, back to you, Mark. Back to Black Gold. I mean, maybe they were forced to do that only afterwards when that pitch deck went public. So, um, I mean, you do have to be careful in that sense. Um, okay, so you know, we 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 then talk about what the format. You should know what the format of your show is whether it's a serialized drama whether it's um you know a limited series um and you should research what each of these things mean i mean if it's a sitcom or if it's a half hour comedy um you know because this show is like you know some executives will immediately assume that there's going to be subtitles across this thing because of its mm -hmm. setting we need to actually um you know yeah uh, front yeah, up front, the fact that no, it's it's in English, but there are occasional scenes in Indonesian, Thai, Malaysian, and Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, and Which adds to the authenticity, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I have a series overview, which basically talks about the story. Um, this, this deck was done about a year and a half ago. I've since adopted the principle of only using one image per page. However, which we will discuss <laughs> when it comes to Holocode code very shortly. This seemed fair because it really is. I want I want this it to be very clear that this is about two people equally. You know, it's mm. about a husband and wife um, who are both caught in this world of, of oil oil dealing during the Cold War. Um, but you know, it, I, I do we do give a sense through our choice of image of the, the casting. You know, it's it's you don't put. Um, the names of the actors there per se but you you do give a sense of who who you know executives like to be able to imagine to people in the role mm -hmm. right i i get this and i see marquee uh 
it, it, the roles that all track marquee names, right? No. That's that's what I get from that, and that's a good feeling to have. And it also immediately deals with some of your concern over like non-white, non-American setting by putting such a uh, piece of marquee casting there. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, look, it's a, it's a it's a shame that that is the thing. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a person of, of color, but you know, the market um, is is still favors um, a, a preconceived notion. You know, and that will change over time. But I mean, there aren't many actors um, that can play the role of a of, a, of an Indonesian man. You know? mm. uh, Henry Golding is is recently successful because of Crazy Rich Asians. So that's a that's an example. But mm. um, something like this is is quite tough. Um, and then we go into okay so the series overview is a little bit more like an expanded log line right it's but what i like to kind of define this encapsulating is really the journey um like what's what's really going on uh in the series what's it, what what is it really about beyond the, the physical premise of what the characters are doing uh and it's about corruption it's about influence it's about power it's about um you know, America's involvement in the in the Far East uh, and Southeast Asia, um, and and uh, it's about loyalty and about family. So it's it's it re- you you want to be able to read that paragraph and get a sense of of why what would make the casual viewer want to watch the series. Mm. And then um, we have comps. Um, oh, with- you 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 do a comp. Okay, so we should terminology alert here. Buzzword mm. comps. Comps are comparisons, just for those who don't yeah. know the terminology. And, you know, I dislike that word, but um, it's a it's a word producers use. Um, uh, I, I don't know any, what else would you use there? Um, I mean, it's the classic kind of, it's Jaws in space for <laughs> Alien in a way, yeah, you know. Right. Um, and this does raise something that I've been thinking about, which is posters, right? And And title treatments. And we will continue with this. But something that I've started doing with my scripts and Chaz and I have talked about it is we actually get title treatments done for the the film title, right? Just on the script. If that's the first thing that we do, get a designer or do it myself, but prefer to use a designer to come out. So the first page of the script at least hints to the tone of the show. And sometimes it'll get worked up more into be a poster like this. Because that, if that's all that you've got as your pitch material, but that's on the front of the script, it tells the producer or the reader, the tone of the show, the potential audience, which is what posters do, right? That's their point of them, you know? And it, and it is something that you can build your pitch deck around. But I think there's a lot of advantage in that, you know, as much, and people laugh at the cliches and the posters, but the Syriana, the, the, this is a language that audiences understand and producers understand. And I mean, this, this is not, you know, in advertising when they do pitches, you know, treatments, the treatments are much more attractive design wise than this, you know, you, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a designer. I'm not a graphic designer, you know, and I'm not, my typography is not great. I just use basic fonts, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, and, and, and I'm showing these treatments for a reason because of their simplicity, you know, um, and it is, it is simple things like frames and, and choice of imagery that really help something stand out, but it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't mm. have to, a graphic designer you know. yeah and i mean just going to stew your point about a title treatment on a script it's going to what you said earlier mark is everything is about the person who's reading it thinking oh this is already a thing you know like yeah. it's leading them to believe in the end product more than the document well it's kind of manifest destiny in a sense you mm. know? um you, you're already painting a picture in their mind of a of a, of a commercial ent- uh, property yeah. And every little piece of, of, of work you can do, like designing a title, like designing a poster, it will impress them because it'll show work ethic as well. Mm. You know, it'll show care and, and, and um, uh, passion. You know. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, as I said, uh, the characters... Morning, the- uh, finish off the comps. <laughs> we'll come back to the comps and then we can go to the next page. Yeah, but, um, yeah so it's, it's don't have too many comps, you know. Um, like we we show fewer um, comparisons visually than than are actually listed there, 
I mean, if I were to put the poster for the Year of Living Dangerously, people would immediately get the wrong impression, think it's dated. However, it's really the only one of the only major films that's ever been set in Indonesia. Um, so you don't you don't have to um, put everything there that your show is 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 can be likened to. Um, so so be be careful what you do select. Um, mm. And you know this comes back to market. Um, you know, and what people are out there looking for. You can't really guess what the market is going to want. Um, and you, it, it, it would be kind of impossible to determine, you know, your career by what people want. <laughs> uh, you, you know, and, and, and I was, I was going to talk a little bit about the idea of rejection. I mean, when you're putting these pitches out, you, you, you need to be accustomed to rejection. You know, and it's 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 not like you need to be self sabotaging and, and immediately believe that that something you put out there is going to be turned down or rejected. But the better you are at, at uh, receiving rejection, um, the 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 more prolific you're going to be at getting your project out there to to numerous people. And and honestly, like every buyer, every, and a buyer is a production company or producer that you that you send your material out to. Everyone. Um, everyone that you send it out to already has a notion of what they're going to make next. They or they already have a notion of what it is they're looking for. And they've already decided not to make your thing even before they've seen it. So your pitch deck has to give them a reason to say yes, you know, a reason to change their mind. I touching on that and this ties into your background in music videos and commercials. I used to work for Michael Gracie who later went on to direct um, the greatest showman when he was directing commercials and he always said he put so much effort in his pitch materials because he would he said even if I don't win the job I've got jobs because I did such a good job with the pitch that they liked the vision not, not like this is me putting words into his mouth but it was essentially like do a good job with the pitch because that is your brand it's your marketing and people will come back to you even if you don't win that job if they like the pitch they will find something else for you Right. And I think that's a really good philosophy for writing. It's it's the same way that a sample, a script can serve as a sample for other work. The pitch can serve as an example of the vision or the feel. Because look, we're operating in an interesting world that is screenwriters as we they have become, you know, we have to kind of be filmmakers as well, you know. I'm and I'm using that in that sense that there's this line where we gotta start hustling our own material. We gotta start selling our own material if we're just focusing on screenwriting, right? Mm -hmm. And having an awareness that a, a producer might like the writing, but you know, the pitch is the first way in. And as a director in particular, if you're presenting a vision, you'd hope that people will come back, right? And see what else that you're interested in because it creates a good impression. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and- Or producers that you work with, they might be more happy to work with you because you know how to sell what you're pitching. And yeah. in the example of this, Black Gold, how do you sell something that is otherwise seems esoteric? And once you go, it's Syriana, it's the Americans, it's the night manager. You're like, oh, cool. I've got that, right? There is an audience for this. Yeah. So Mark, when we did our, our pre-call, you said that your views and how you put pitch text together has evolved. Is this a reflection of where you're at now? Or is this like, I've changed my style since doing this? I, I, I believe I've changed my style since doing this. Like I used to overuse this font. <laughs> <laughs> It's just little things, you know, like even even the aspect ratio of the document <coughs> I'm using now has like narrowed a little bit. It's gone a little bit more widescreen um, than, than this. But I guess for TV, this is fine because it's pretty much 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And that's, I try <laughs> to make the PDFs fit the aspect ratio of the show. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a fascinating idea that a lot of, I think, people like me just wouldn't think of doing is making my document in like two, three, five aspect ratio. Like there's no reason not to do that. And that's very easy to do. And no, yet it's not. No, <laughs> I tried doing it. We'll talk about oh, that. Okay, it's a little bit right. harder. Um, <laughs> you've got to set up like page. Yeah. You, you've basically got to create a page. That's a two, three, five page, mm -hmm. at least on a Mac. Um, yeah. But it, it, it does hint to knowing your audience. And I would like to continue looking at this, but um Friend of the podcast, Q, who was a development executive at ABC now at Netflix, she actually was talking about horizontal versus 
uh, vertical pitch documents because that's like a controversial thing. Do I do this kind of like portrait layout or do I go landscape layout? And I'm normally like, oh, landscape. And this is my commercials background because people are going to look it on their computer. And she's like, oh, I hate landscape because we print stuff out. This is when she was mm. at the ABC. Mm. And I'll link to the Twitter thread so it doesn't feel like I'm making stuff up. Mm. Um, she's like, I just print stuff out. And landscape is so annoying, right? Mm. So it feels like, but she's coming from a, I'm going to read the words on the page. Yeah. Right? Very mm. kind of <laughs> what I would feel is stereotypical ABC. You know, she wants the words on the page and wants to know where the story is. So you've got to design your material in such a way that it is modular. That's what I think. You know, that's what I'm picking up. That if you're pitching to the US, do something like what Mark's done here. But if you're pitching to the ABC or Screen Australia, it may be less visual and you've got to have a way to work that material. But you might reuse some of the fonts. You might reuse a poster, you know, design your material so you can configure it to who your audience is, to whom you're pitching and use pitching as an opportunity um, and I had this discussion with a friend of the podcast, Paul, this week. Sometimes who you pitch to, that order that you pitch to is an opportunity for you to get feedback. In the same way that you plan your feedback with readers, and Jazz and I did this this week with a script. It's like, we'll send it to this reader first. They'll give us these notes that we'll address and then we'll send it to these other readers, you know, because Julio is going to be more, not more forgiving, but he's going to mm-hmm. be really useful really early on, right? And it feels like sometimes like maybe you've got to plan your pitches in such in the same way. I don't know. I don't know if that's your experience, Mark, but that's my experience pitching a couple of projects in mm. Australia that we used it, um, that we pitched to our not least favourite, like we were happy with anyone, but you kind of have a strategy of who you're taking it out to and use the opportunity to inform what Look, you're doing and how you're approaching it. In Australia particularly, and, and when pitching to the government bodies, you know, because um, I've done that extensively, um, you, you, you can't take the approach that you take with the Americans where everything needs to be concise and about brevity. You, you have to take the opposite approach because if, if you haven't got things fleshed out when you, when you pitch to Screen Australia or you pitch to Screen New South Wales or Screen Victoria, that's, that's what they jump on. Um, and I mean, I mean, I don't know if that's the case right now, but it was certainly the case 10 years ago when I got funded for my shorts um, and, and when Enzo and I... Um, or Enzo pitched for Invent Zero and, and we pitched for Airlock, um, was that you had to have it figured out, you know. Um, whereas the more information you put in a, in a document that, that's going to a Hollywood um, executive, the more you include, seem, it seems to work against you. Um, so it, it's horse, <laughs> horse, you know. It, it's, the, it's, it's the reasons for why they're making material. And I loved this line, I'm going to use it again, uh, that you said in the pre-call when talking about funding in Australian context was these film bodies want to know what are the kind of cultural, moral and ethical reasons for making your project. It's not just about who the audience is. That's part of it. But they want to know kind of like on a deeper level why they should make it. Whereas it feels like, it's not that these, it's just, that's a very, like, effectively, we fund, we have funding bodies in order to create culture, right? Yes. Um, and so, therefore, their question is, is this good culture? Yes. <laughs> and that's a tough question, right? And so, it feels like your materials need to speak to that, you know? And we'll talk about that in the context of Holocode, because that's where it came up, which is the, pro- the difficulty I had and it was unsuccessful, pitching a project that is a very genre pitcher and then trying to also sell the fact that it's good culture, you know, that it's like Yalno yogurt and not like um, your play. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I feel like the most important question that came from the government bodies when I was pitching, and you know, was why I was making what I, or wanting to make what I was wanting to make. You know, um, I, I think that's as important as, as what the actual content, or more maybe more important than the content. You know. Anyway, and should we continue? Understanding that will help people get less upset about things that get funded. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? it's it's about culture, and when you kind of get your head into that, you're like, okay, cool. You know, that's why we do it. Because if it was just about the market, the market would take care of it. Yeah. In theory. <laughs> Um, should we continue with this book? Because obviously we're on page five of 31. And I think it's really useful for people to see who haven't seen a lookbook. And this is for a project that people are you're just pitching. I think this is awesome. You know? yeah. I mean, look, one of the major things uh, about doing a pitch deck is you have to know your project inside and out before you even attempt a pitch deck. 
because you know as we've all written screenplays writing a synopsis is some after after the fact is harder than <laughs> writing the actual script in some cases <laughs> often it's better if it's a third party or somebody it's not you writing your your synopsis and that's why coverage services offer that uh, that service but um it, it's like sometimes i i have to i can only do the pitch deck after i've done the script because i have to be able to distill who in this case sam norridan is in in a couple of paragraphs you know um and 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 find a way to express his soul um and and i can only do that if i know the project um, but really what these blurbs are about when you're talking about characters is the arc it's where is your character going to start from uh or where has he come from what's his what's his backstory in a couple of sentences where is he when the show begins and where is he going to end up you know and and for this show in particular it's about a rise and fall it's a typical kind of um good godfather type story about it an innocent who's swept into a world of corruption and has righteous intentions and is ultimately corrupted and um you know jane his wife is like the moral compass of the story but she's uh, you know, a woman in a patriarchal society who is you know not just a patriarchal society but a patriarchal Islam islamic society um and a foreigner so she's you know these are all interesting things you get to take the most interesting little nuggets about your story and uh really express them in the pitch deck um because that is what what executives will hook on to i mean I, I was working on a horror film about um uh, set in a storage facility and um and an executive uh that we pitched it to had gone and done some research about storage facilities and just became like hooked into all the sorted little things that the people put in the in the in the story <laughs> so you don't know what a particular executive will gravitate toward you know um so it's important to really find those interesting uh unique things about your mm. project and, and exemplify them mm. um yeah so you know I, I i probably picked the top what what is it two four six so five or six mm. uh seven characters mm. you know no more than that um and you know i think john truby or one of the screenwriting gurus talks about the character web and you know the quadrants of like antagonist protagonist but um you know ally and fake ally and all of those things mm -hmm. for and against each other it's almost like you want your character um breakdowns to represent the character web of the story mm -hmm. in the world. Yep. So a lot of these characters are, you know, archetypal to the story. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I have a pilot outline, uh, which mm -hmm. I think is important. Um, you, you don't have to necessarily have a pilot outline in the very first thing that you send across to, um, to somebody who, who you're trying, whose attention you're trying to attack, attract, uh, because maybe you want them to read the script. Um, but I've, I, from my experience, um, so for the, for the show that I sold successfully, um, they didn't have the pilot outline because ultimately what, what will happen sometimes is if you're kind of a, a no name writer, um, <laughs> You, you they'll they'll ultimately the networks will ultimately want to attach a showrunner or a or a a list writer and and then the pilot will be reconfigured and it'll be re remade so what i sold successfully was a pitch um but if i but with this the, ca the case of black gold we already have a pilot so there's a pilot outline in the pitch deck but um you know, if you haven't if you haven't got the pilot script yet, I would I would say leave leave it out and just keep it a bit broader. Hmm. Um, and what I've done is basically over four pages, I've I've basically taken a one page synopsis of the pilot and I've broken it into paragraphs, and broken my own rule about having one image per page. <laughs> um, but in this case, hmm. it kind of worked because it it just 
there's so many facets to, to this story that, it, you know, I wanted to illustrate a couple of things. I, um, I, I mean, yeah. obviously you've got more experience than me, but I always think the danger of doing one page per image is it makes the image do a lot of heavy lifting exactly. and then it can make it feel like it needs to be specifically this as opposed to it's kind of this, yeah. right? And what I get from the, even just two images is it, it, it in a good way, dilutes it. It's kind of this. It's in this direction, but it's its own thing. Read the text. You know. But also something that we'll get to, I think, when we look at the holocode one that Mark gave us notes on. Here, you're actually talking through a plot. So the multiple images is like, I am moving through story. It's not like a world or a character or a feeling. This yes. is giving a sense of visual progression as well. Yeah, like these are these are the thumbnails of the chapter markings on the DVD. For those who remember such things, <laughs> pretty much just Chaz. <laughs> yeah, Chaz Mark has a big Blu-ray collection. We had this to chat just before. <laughs> My Blu-ray collection is sitting in a storage unit in Sydney. So anyone well, who's if, if you need someone to ship it to, <laughs> Chaz. <laughs> I think I have about six different versions of seven. So I hope you like that movie. Uh, I do. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I bond. We yeah, the the Fincher obsession was definitely something that attracted me to your work. Um, awesome. um, okay, this is interesting because one thing that I one term I've heard being bandied around town is story engines, uh, and I think um, it was it was being used by a big showrunner that my my mate who was an attachment on a, on a series here um was using um might have been kurt sutter i'm not sure um but basically story engines is like i guess it's the multiple plot friends uh, plot strands of the series or what are the what are the four major driving forces of the series i guess with stranger things it would be the families and uh, and then it would be the friends and then it would be the aliens and then it would be the government, you know, for instance, you know, would be the main story drivers and those four things would be pushing forward each, each episode, you know, uh, in, in, in different ways. Um, but here, because um, Black Gold in, is a little bit like Mad Men in a sense that it, it revolves around the establishment of a company. Um, that would be the main, you know, one of the main story drivers is how is the, the kind of the startup feeling that like season three of Mad Men had when they, mm. when Don Draper left um, the agency he was with to form his own agency. Um, so we've got the company, we've got the marriage, we've got the family and we've got the past. Um, and those four things are, are literally the things that drive the story. I mean, you know, in, in Girls, for instance, the HBO show, maybe it's the French, um, um, you know, so everything's unique to your own your own story and you have to kind of figure out what that is. And it's, I think it's a very powerful thing to, uh, to be able to articulate. Because, yeah, uh, it's it's definitely something that, funny, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure the a funding application that both Chas and I did for separate projects had us talk about the story engine. But what I like about this is you read the, you read the heading, the company, and see the company and the accompanying images, and I get a sense of what the engine is on a on a visual level and on a visceral level. You know that kind of oil extraction. It's like, oh, I get that. You know the marriage here, and I think it's interesting. You used um, that particular frame from uh, Crazy Rich Asians carries an emotional weight that I'm probably subconscious of. Yeah. That makes me go, oh, there's going to be some conflict in the marriage. You know, and I think that's cool. So you're telling me if if I scan through this, you know, if I sit there and just go, oh, I got this PDF, da, 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 I'm getting a sense of what the show is. You know, yeah. the past. You know, your choice of imagery, as you say, it's not necessarily that you're spending a lot of time in making this a beautifully laid out document. It's that you're choosing, you're spending time and energy choosing imagery that supports these core ideas that are visual, are the cinematic, I'm not just gonna say visual, I'm gonna say the cinematic representation. And that's important because, you know, it's very easy to lose sight, as I've said, of the fact that we're trying to create in a broad sense cinema, then, yeah. you know, that, that the eventual goal is visual, not written. And, you know. and on that note, I mean, I don't, I don't just browse the web and find one image and go, yep, that's going in the past section. Um, 
it's it's a very very rough and tumble process i mean for every image in this deck as you know you're probably collecting 50 <laughs> mm. or 10 you know let's say let's say it's it's been between 10 and 50 images and then you put them all in a folder and then um you know i i i first write the text i write the text in a word doc or a pages doc mm -hmm. and i make sure that the text kind of when i have that down in really helps me know what images to look for um otherwise mm -hmm. i'm just kind of flying blind and i'm just you know i'm just aimlessly wandering through movies i think are referential but if i if i know that you know um you know this this is about this character being in a spiritual crossroads and i've already written that when i go through and i collect a vague kind of notion of, of images that give me a, mood, a, a sense and tone when i'm scrolling through that folder I'll know when I look at that image, I'm like, okay, that, that could work for that section. And sometimes it's a bit of rearranging, like, uh, you know, those mm. 50 or 500 images that I would collect for a particular deck, I might sp spend an hour just rearranging them into the different folders um, according to the sections of the deck. And sometimes I'll end up using images that I put in the cinematography folder for the plot because I'll, I'll realize, oh, hang on, that plot image, yes, it, although it's specific to, um, you know, I'm sort of jumping the, the gun here a little bit. But, <laughs> um, I'll just briefly touch mm. on, um, you know, something that I've placed in the cinematography folder might work better for the, the plot. You know, mm -hmm. so just so everybody knows, it's not a it's not a rigid process. It's a very kind of organic process of finding the imagery in the, in the deck. Mm. And, and we can talk about that more specifically in the kind of more toolsy thing but i think it's so important that what you've done here whether or not you're conscious of it is that there is a consistency of aesthetic right and, and that's partly happening just by the fact that you combine things together and they start feeling like they're unified yeah. but the fact is the reason that your cinematography image might work in your plot area is that ultimately when the film is going to create it it's going to have a cohesive um palette in a broad sense Right, it's not just the color palette, but it's going to have a tone, a visual approach that ultimately should permeate everything. Right? I mean, this is me being very um, like systematic in terms of my thinking, but your visual approach relates to your plot, which relates to your characters and all that stuff. And if you're doing a good job choosing this stuff, and this is why it's kind of a visual development tool as much as anything else, it should start feeling cohesive. And images that jump out at you when or jump out at others when they're flicking through probably should be removed because they're not part of the visual language that you're choosing in the same way that word choice you know if you're a writer sometimes you'll be like oh yeah that word doesn't or that sentence structure doesn't sit in the tone or the vocabulary of the script that can happen with the visual we um and i'm just using it because we handed in Chaz and i finished a, a, our horror feature that we sent out to a couple of readers this week. And we wrote in some jokes for ourselves that we left in because we're like, mm -hmm. aha, that'll be really funny. So you have a character being like, no. And the parenthetical is in her best Vader impression. No, mm -hmm. right? Totally completely out of whack. Yeah. And, a ca and a reader was like, that's really out of whack. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, we knew that, but we should have <laughs> taken it out, right? But it actually shows you as writers, we understand kind of the, the importance for tonal consistency in in written language and that should apply for the visual the visual as well and so maybe it took a, a, it's not a rule of thumb in the same way that we've got readers for our scripts we should have readers for our pitch decks yeah. if it's not a producer if you're doing this as something that's on your for you uh, you know that you're going to send it to to other people with your here's my actual script here's the pitch deck the visual materials make sure that you're having your PDF or whatever looked over by others that can have that impression of like, that sticks out. That's like the Vader no, that's totally inconsistent. Or I love that image, you know? And it's like, well, maybe I should make more of that because that image might end up speaking to the whole show in the same way that a line of dialogue or a character description can speak to the, the script, you know? But you've, I mean, that's what I'm noticing here. There is a consistency of visual language that you've used. Production design, nothing here is, because this is period, nothing here says, not period, you know, yeah. even something from Crazy Rich Asians, the way you've cropped the images is making it feel like it could be, it's not timeless, but it's obviously like 20, it can be 20th century, not 21st yeah. century. It's, it's recontextualized from the comedy that it came from. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, like that. I yeah, you you forget that the body image is from a comedy. It feels more serious um, because of the top image because she's a little bit more stern. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and 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 the text is talking about how he becomes a bit of a playboy through the series. So it's kind of you, you get the sense that he's up to no good on that boat. Um, <laughs> so the next the next section that I included in this, you know, is is future seasons, which is yeah. is obvious, but it's. You know, you don't want to go into too much detail. Um, and I had a longer version of this document originally where I I did way more detail about what happens in the show. But ultimately, sometimes less is more because the more you include, um, you're also giving people more reasons to say, no, it's a catch-22. It's, catch it's like you don't want to have it half-baked or light on, uh, but you don't want to you don't want to have it so developed that there's nowhere for it to go because ultimately Mm. buyers are looking to collaborate with you. They want to share the process of, of creating this show and it, and it's more particular for television. And have input as well. I it'll be interesting to see because so many of these cars, like, as you say, you're not being prescriptive. We're talking about how to visually sell an idea and all that kind of stuff, but it'll be interesting when we get to hollow code to look at, whether there's cards or ideas or structures to these documents that you think are more appropriate for a feature than for TV. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll look at a couple of samples um, for that as well. Um, So, you know, all I do is basically, basically a couple of paragraphs about what those two, you know, seasons could be. It's more hypothetical, you know, Um, but you do want to get a sense of how the character changes over the seasons. And I mean, we we all we all know those shows that have a great first season concept, <laughs> you know, those high concept, you know, network shows, um, but then run out of steam, you know. So you, you do want to you do want to show where where your show can, can go, what the, mm. what the longevity of it is. Um, and then then we talk about tone, you know, uh, which I think is important um, because tone is a writing thing, as as Stu said before. Um, so even if you're a writer, um, um, if, you know, selling a show, uh, the concept for a show, you, you really have to be really specific about the tone, what, what is allowed, what, what isn't allowed. You know, this, this show is darkly romantic. It's provocative, but it's also artful and it's character driven. Um, you know, it, I, I, I didn't use those Wong Kar Wai references by accident. You know, they're very specific mm-hmm. because I feel like, this could be a show that could have a, a, a real sense of romanticism and almost um, non-literalness to it, you know, um, different to regular TV shows. And who knows how that's going to go down because we, we haven't pitched this yet, but um, it could be, it could be interesting. I've never seen that before. I've never seen a, a TV show that kind of like breaks, breaks away to, you know, uh, unless, except, except the, the series that was done by K- Christoph Koslowski, uh, Decalogue. Hmm. Um, I've never seen, you know, shows that are, uh, allow themselves to be very expressive. Um, you know, so that I, I've, I've got a couple of pages on the tone only because it's such hmm. an important thing. And it's about, you know, I talk a little bit about subtext. I talk a little bit about emotion. And I do, I do mention a couple of references like The Godfather because it is a rise and fall. Now, the thing about references is you, you want to have them be specific, but you don't want to have so many references that they end up cancelling each other out. You know, it's like you, you might just want the, you know, the family dynamic of the, of the Godfather, but what you're selling is a comedy. So be, be careful with what references you <laughs> Um, and then a really important section which is is extremely consistent through all of the pitch decks even the stranger things one um, especially um, is this section about the world Um, because the world the setting of a tv series is its selling point often you know um, cold war american suburbs inhabited by russian sleeper cells you know that's the american that's the world of the americans um uh, the ad- ad- advertising industry in Madison Avenue in the 60s and 70s—that's Mad Men. You know, the, these these settings sell 
the series. So never underestimate the importance of. Would you would you consider moving this section higher in the pitch deck where you doing it now? Yeah, I mean, it could probably go before all this specific stuff about the the plot. Mm. You know, it could probably go right after the right before the pilot outline, right after the characters. Mm. Yeah, it probably should. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and and this points out, and you know, we don't want to lead people down certain paths for writing. But one of the dangers of doing something like this in Word, besides the fact that Word sucks for page layout, <laughs> is that you want to be able to move stuff around, right? Yeah. And you want to move stuff around and take it out. And that's the modular approach. That's one of the reasons I like pages, but it's not the only solution. Where you want to be able to go, oh, that section here, well, should come up. That page should come down. And that, or I'm going to take out all that detail, plot detail, because this might be an initial general where all I'm pitching is the tone, the world, and the overall plot. And then there's a version of it with characters. You want to be able to um, basically make a custom pitch deck. I'm is the impression I'm getting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, if, if, you, if you're time starved and you, you work nine till. 11 in a call center and and all you had time to do was write your screenplay for lunch break and and the the the, the possibility of working on a pitch deck is just unfathomable mm. uh you can you can pay somebody to do it for you you know uh and, and generally what you'll pay for a, a professional visual researcher is what they're called or director's mm. assistant da's um, um is is about 400 bucks a day you know, for, mm. for maybe two or three days. Um, so you're looking at probably about 1200 bucks for a good pitch deck. Um, and, and sometimes that could work better for you because you can, you can be the objective element, you know, mm. um, you, can, you can, you can allow yourself to be surprised by what that visual researcher um, can come up with. And, and sometimes somebody's third party vision of your concept it's, it's it's like when when you cast actors and they come on set and they do these really interesting things you know it, it often exceeds your expectation so that that's another approach for people too but i i recommend learning how to do them yourself so that you know as fincher says no one can pull the wool over your eyes you know you got to know what a dolly does so when the grip lies to you about <laughs> not being able to assemble something because you know it's because he's lazy not because uh yeah yeah, which is one of the conversations we might get to in Back Matter if we get time about the difference between American crews and Australian crews. But anyway, well, I don't want to be on we love that. Australian crews. That's uh, that's good. <clears throat> um, and you know, like this this page of the world is about painting contrast between the elite world of the show and the and the mm-hmm. and the poverty stricken um, developing world mm. set of the show. And and what I like about this is that. Without saying it, it's indicating that you're going to use color palette as a way of differentiating those worlds, right? Yeah. You know, that the opulence, the gold, money, the gambling, all that stuff, and the coldness of the kind of the gangsters and then the kind of more dreary drabness of of the, um, not squalor, but, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. And well, it, it is, you know, I've lived in Indonesia and uh, um, it, it it, people are just living in abject spoil, you know, uh, in, in many cases. Um, but there's something, you know, I guess what we're trying to portray with this show is that our hero comes from that world of squalor, but has made something of himself in, in the elite world, but is, but is in danger of forgetting where he came from, you know, mm. uh, in danger of, of leaving his people behind and, getting what he should be fighting for and then you know if your show is about a real life story um as ours is i I won't Hmm. sit i won't sit on this page for too long because actually we don't want that to to known a a fact (laughs) but the point is you're actually including like these are the real details at the end which some films do it in their end credits you know it's that whole this is the real person this is the um the real photo i can't remember what Oh, wasn't that your favorite film, American Hustle Jazz? <laughs> Which I didn't. Do they love. have like the photos of the real people at the end. I can't remember. There's a few films yeah. that have done that. There's many films, but I I did it with my um, biopic screenplay that I wrote. Like in the end, because it's it, it was such an absurd story that had so much 
stuff that you just wouldn't believe in there that I got like the real press clippings and the pictures of people and just put it at the end. So that when someone got to the end and thought, oh, well, that was a fun story, but no way is it real. They get to the last page and they're like, what? Yeah, yeah. That's actually a really cool idea for a pitch deck, actually. You may including... want to leave with that. You mm. may want to leave with that. You know, oh, um, this project is dead, dead, dead. <laughs> well, you could talk about it then. I'm assuming it's it's as the Wonder Woman creator script. Like I had a I had a spec circulating when the one that got made was circulating about the creator of um, Wonder Woman, and they got the green light first. Sadly, it is they're in a throuple. That's one of their mm. stories. It was yeah, but it, but it wasn't just like oh, like the absurdity that he contributed to the invention of the polygraph test but then used it to sell like gillette razors and stuff like that it was getting investigated by the fbi for fraud while also creating wonder woman to uh show people like how bondage is actually a good thing for like love and contentment so anyway yeah (laughs) i mean it would have been interesting to see how that would have gone with an accompanying pitch deck you know, incorporating yeah. some of that real life imagery. Mm. So um, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. That's TV deck. And what's interesting is how much that there's a lot of written material that writers will do in developing their decks. Uh, that is that. And they just might need to. And I think this is one of the things we'll talk about with Holocode. We keep on talking about it. Um, mm. That you might need to optimize your language a little bit. That's what I discovered revisiting it was like how much the language that I wrote, because I clearly wrote it in another document is like, this doesn't need to be as wordy for a pitch Mm. doc. Like this is literally one sentence and who cares Mm. if it's fragmented on its own page, you know, as opposed to it needs to be an essay, you know. Um, I'll quickly show you guys another example of a TV show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely different, which is a a comedy. Um, But also to, you know, to reassure people that you know you don't have to be a whiz you know visually if you if you just want to do a simple white background with text mm-hmm. um you could you could do something like this you know uh it's super minimalistic um this is kind of a show about uh actually that my sister created um about uh, a girl who gets a very cynical young woman who gets sucked into a um a healing cult in the Topanga Mountains of Los Angeles. and if Someone gets sucked into a cult in Los Angeles? That never happens. Yeah. Um, and it's okay. about healing? Really? <laughs> <laughs> but then she ends up uh, realising that the whole thing's a grift but, and, and decides to become, uh, to usurp its leader and become become the leader of this mm-hmm. cult so that she can just make a ton of money. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like this is, this is, I'll just give you a quick overview, but it's it's super simple, you know, paragraphs of text against a white background sometimes this can be the best thing you know a white background can sometimes give you a fresher feeling a less oppressive feeling than a than a black background Mm. um and and sometimes montage pages uh work uh, against a white background you know um it just depends on the content of of the series um so don't be intimidated by not knowing indesign and and fonts and all this if you if you want to do something simple you can do it do it well we have someone in the um in the chat uh megan who worked at channel seven here in australia and said she uses pages a lot and that there are a lot of cheap document template packages you can buy to use as a base as well if you are less design inclined such as myself there you go Mm. um and you know yeah every every deck is different this this one you know, has some unique sections um, that just get the, mm. the tone of it across. But it's very, you know, the the general rules apply. It's world, it's tone, it's uh, pilot outline, it's um, season outlines, it's mood and tone. Um, yeah. Look, and I think you flicking through it actually is a really good thing because this is the point people will get these in their emails and they'll flick through it and then they'll Mm. decide whether or not they invest more time in reading it Mm. right and so it's amazing how much of a difference just a few pictures make in terms of communicating the tone like this is something i'm interested in reading and those montage pages but as you say it's not like they've done i mean maybe they photoshopped some things but it communicates you know And, and it's about communicating your show and communicating what it's going to be in a visual medium you know And um, I mean, I could, talk, I could talk a bit about where to get those images from if you want. Um, 
may as well now before yeah. we launch into into ours yeah um so there are a few different resources i use i mean what i first try to do is i try to make a, a list of obvious references so you know I'm, I'm i'm making a war film you know and I'm, i just off the top of my head make a, a list of a bunch of, of movies like private ryan or whatever it is you know um but then i try to do research and expand that list even before i start looking for images i just want to have a, a, a point of reference you know but if it's you know a specific thing like Fury, which is about tank drivers. I want to be able to find, you know, shots of soldiers in tanks. Sometimes that, that search is going to take a little while, but often uh, there's a bunch of websites you can go to where searching for images is really easy because they lay them out like in a, in a giant um, mood board. Mm. So one of my favorites is, is this gentleman here, Evan E. Richards put together this website. He's a cinematographer. Uh, amazing man and uh, uh, collecting uh, references, uh, sorry, screen grabs of films and, and writing about the cinematography in those films. Um, and if, if you can, please donate to his um, website because he spends a lot of time putting these together. But if you go to his archive, um, you know, I'll just give you an example. I don't know why my internet connection is so slow. Probably Possibly because you're trying to do a Zoom at the same time. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, he has a list of movies and he's a bit selective about, you know, films that he picks, but um, they're, they're all, you know, cinematographer wet dream films. But, you, know, <laughs> and he's, you know, but if you pick like Fight Club, um, what you'll get is, you know, a page with just almost every single frame from Fight Club, you know, in high res. And I try to look for high res images. Um, no one likes looking at pitch decks with pixelated images. Um, and what that means is it limits me to the images that I can use. But um, sometimes that makes the process a little bit easier because it's, it's sometimes better to pick through a hundred images than it is to pick through 10,000 when, when you're looking at every single resolution, it just becomes a nightmare. Have so, you ever uh, gone and got like gone to a shop and bought a Blu-ray and stuck it in your pic in your computer and taken a screen oh, shot nice. just to? Oh man, I used it? to. I used to in the in the late two thousands pitching for commercials. We would go to the rent black when there was Blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> we would rent like you know ten weeklies for ten dollars, and like four of us would do it with separate accounts and just mm. rip frames because that was the only way to do it. Yeah. Now I can't think of old. Mm -hmm. um, but but these websites exist now so uh, and a lot of those films that you would you would be renting they're just they're all on here you know um so this is super good i mean you can look at i mean it's beautiful just to see the way fight club evolves visually as well and it's thumbnail um from when you click yeah. on one of these images you know you get a image you know that when you blow it up and put it on a deck it's not gonna it's not gonna pixelate too much mm. so there's um some software that can add to it there's oh i've just got an l media l media player which is a not so free like vlc equivalent will actually you can set it to do snapshots like every second on a video mm. file okay and so you can actually give it like a quick time or whatever and it will just create a folder full of frames um I'm not saying that this is the easiest way to collate it all, <laughs> but this is great. Um, there's uh, also Blu-ray.com. It's got, you can sign up and not get the thumbnails, but Blu-ray.com literally has example thumbnails screenshotted from Blu-rays. Um, do you mind unsharing your screen, yeah. Mark? Yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, this is great. Like if you're looking for specific films, mm -hmm. well, um, sorry, I've got two computers here, so I'm <laughs> at the the main one uh and then there's a couple of pieces there's a piece of software that's less free um called eagle which was and i'll show you what's really cool about it for those uh okay let's do fight club and i'm going to share this So 
So with this, you'll go to screenshots. And if you're, if you've got a user at the moment, um, ugh, you don't want to do it like that. Mm. Like it will have full high res, uh, 1080p screenshots. Um, and if you actually sign up as a member, you get access to 1080p and you won't have the, the, the water mark in the corner. The, the main one that I'm just, it's not so free, but I found it, I've found it heaps. Where is my Zoom? There we go. I'm going to stop share. Um, is, is this software, and I tried a bunch uh, of image cataloging software rather than just doing it in um, email, uh, in folders, which is can be very useful. Uh, but one of the things I used to like that I really like about Final Cut Pro 10, and I'm not in con controversial opinion, like, <laughs> but it has tagging. So essentially, there's this software called Eagle that lets you build a design image library based on a folder and lets you tag images in multiple things. But what's really cool is you can see over here is it will assume a color palette and you can search mm -hmm. by color. So you can literally oh, wow. go, I want to show all the images I have in my library that are of that color. And then you can create a search library, which makes it really useful if you've got like a, a color palette for your project or where you need a transitional image in terms of um, color to go and find it. So it's, I actually find it really cool. It is not free. Um, but it is very handy. You can tell that these the people that created this comes from, I think, um, either Taiwan or Singapore. But it's it's for designers. It's for graphic designers that and, ad, and comes from Adland. Um, but it's it's very handy for building a pretty extensive library, which I do. I just literally gra I have a folder which I normally use for desktop pictures, but also doubles as my um, image reference library. Is that next door or is that? That's actually my flatmate repairing the back door. Anyway, <laughs> dogs. Um, so should we, mm. it's good that we mentioned yeah. that. Um, there's, uh, oh, look, I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm in lecture mode. Mm -hmm. um, for those who use Adobe products, um, there's a couple of cool little apps, uh, web apps that Adobe have. One, which is, uh, Adobe fonts. But what's really cool about Adobe fonts is if you look up here, it's like search fonts. You can actually search based on an image. So you can upload an image to get, I might as well, look, this is all I've got open. Um, and it will scan the file and then you can give it a, and it will detect typography and it will detect the font. It will try to determine the font. This is this is really useful if you like the tone well, of a font, and, and it goes <laughs> right. And oh look, it actually got it correct. Mm -hmm. That is, it is ITC avant garde, but it means it can kind of ballpark you right in the in the right area. There's if you've got a low res image, do you know about Tin Eye Mark? No. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, Tin Eye Google's got it now, but effectively Tin Eye is a reverse image search. So you upload an image and it won't find one of these. Maybe it will. Uh, but effectively it will find images that match and it can sort them by resolution. So if you've got a low res thumbnail, um, it didn't find it, but I'm not gonna find one. Effectively allows you to find higher res copies. Yeah. Very useful. Yeah. I usually use Google for that, but- um, All right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Google ended up bought, buying them or incorporating the technology. I just try to avoid. <laughs> as a little bit of google uh and i think the the last couple of things and and this will lead us into holocode if we want to break down that next well i think we should break that down next at last given we've been going for an hour and a half <laughs> oh my gosh we're so much... <laughs> it's been um, so much well, fun <laughs> we can maybe make a, a list of resources available for the listeners yeah. uh, we'll, we'll... We'll see if we got time to break, uh, give Mel some feedback at the end, but uh, if not, sorry, Mel. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the original Holocode lookbook, what we shared with Mark. Um, effectively, the point was that the Holocode uh, lookbook uses concept art. I'm a big fan of concept art. There's a few concept art websites that I follow. Uh, a lot of great concept arts artists on ArtStation, but there's also Concept Art World. Um, and I use that because it doesn't feel, it feels more, it could be stuff that you've made for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. But as Mark points out, pointed out, um, it's slightly problematic in that it is not cinematic. 
it, it makes people feel like it's a project in development as opposed to a finished thing. So let's try to, when I actually find where I put it, you think I would have organized this better before mm -hmm. we started, but mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Eloco delivery raw materials. Okay, so this is the, what I'm showing is the lookbook that we shared with Mark and we'll kind of run through his feedback. And then mm -hmm. I spent last night and this morning kind of addressing mm -hmm. some of that feedback. In a little, can, it, can we just put a little bit of context on this, that this was a few years ago, it's a project that I wrote, which is the broad hook is Space Pirates Murder Mystery, but this was your director's lookbook that was accompanying the script. So it wasn't so much a pitch of the whole project. It was a pitch of your take on the project. Is that fair, Stu? And so we've got a bit of yes. assumptions around how much story material they should know from, uh, not from this document. Yeah. So originally it was prepared for Screen Australia. And then when we were emailing other people would be like, here's the log line in the email. Here's mm -hmm. the lookbook, and here's the um, script. It was to try to entice them to read the script. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just going to flick through it quickly. And then we can kind of mm -hmm. run through the few of the things that Mark pointed out. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's got my phone number on it. I'll skip mm -hmm. over that. <laughs> I'm going to start Might have to do some select editing of this uh, live stream. <laughs> All right. So just to point out, this was a, we got a designer to do this page because we wanted like a splash page that had a look and beyond me. Um, and so they kind of did the first two pages though. That's just kind of connected, mm -hmm. right? Mark's first reaction to this, and you can speak up. I'm just speaking on what I took from your notes was like, cool. You kind of get what I was going through here, but it was a little bit contextless. Because what we're trying to show, but you've got no context for it if this is the only thing you're looking at, is that it's an all-female crew and it's kind of got like a Mad Max vibe in terms of look. You get the Mad Max vibe, but you don't know why you're looking at this page, right? And also it's a montage page. And visually I would now, and I didn't get around to it, but um, I would grade that photo because it kind of like sticks out a little bit because of the, the daylight. Right. But again, it was to put a less emphasis on any one individual character and make it like, oh, look, they're just ripping off Mass Effect. Yeah. Even though there's like three characters from Mass Effect. Right. And that was kind of like the director's statement here was like, and this is kind of like an essay. And your point was, because it's seven paragraphs, eight paragraphs, it was to break it up to make it a less dense. Yeah. Right. Um, less and then. Yeah, like a couple of paragraphs per page, that was it. And we'll look at what that came down to. Um, this page, there was a few images you didn't like, and we'll point out what they are because I did take them out. One, this image down here in the corner. This is the montage page, and you've talked about you prefer a single image, um, was looking at the camera, breaking the fourth wall. Concept art makes it feel not a real thing. It makes it harder to imagine. It feels like it's something's being developed. This is a bit vogue. And this is interesting because this is concept art and I've kept it, but you were drawn to this image. And I think it's partly, there is a difference between uh, the top, this bottom image down here and the top image. And this is because this one is actually painted to be more cinematic. It actually looks lit. This I looks like an art piece. <laughs> no, it, uh, yeah. And you'll find that there's a few definitely um, concept artists who will like paint over reference image reference images but no that's 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 a, it's a painting it's just a really good one um similarly uh on this page these two images because they're concept art it's like you're, you're talking about characters but you've got concept art right and this also has a star wars logo and so even though this is a fan piece um and i liked the lighting on it either crop it out or use it on another page to do more with design and your observation which I liked about images like this, like breakers, is to make them in an asp a widescreen aspect ratio that reflects the show. And our show mm -hmm. is specifically, we wanted to shoot it at two to one mm -hmm. uh, aspect ratio. So it's a little bit claustrophobic to do with the environment, but not um, too claustrophobic, like two, three, five, or just mm -hmm. distances mm -hmm. from the characters in the environment we're shooting in. It's a submarine. Mm -hmm. Effectively, it was like, which is what it says here, it's to be shot like a submarine. You're like, ah, oh, one, one too many page here because you kind of have these images, you know, 
these two images down here kind of doing the job. You can get away with more images that are stronger. Um, and same here, con the concept art note, right? That's about the bioluminescence. You're like, this is a cool page, but I'm not sure why it's there. Maybe put some text, some flavor text, mm. right? And so there was that idea of bringing this, even if we, even if we have sent them the story materials, we can't assume that they've read them. You're resting <laughs> on your phone number, by the way. Oh, yeah, cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> for, for all the people that are listening, are listening uh, <laughs> watching. Um, so, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, the, ooh, yeah, I have completely lost my train of thought. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was somewhat of an, of a, an emergency to interrupt you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like a, a flavor, some flavor text. Okay, so we can't, like, we can't work on the assumption that people are actually going to read the email. They might just read the, hey, here's our attachment and open up the, uh, the, the story document or it might get passed on. And we, we should come to the chain of command that's of who gets to look at this material. Because in other words, it's worth having a bit of the story in the document, um, mm. even if you're giving them other materials in this case yeah. the script and we're giving them like a one pager and a lot of materials so let me just um upload a uh, screen share where we're at i mean to shorthand it that to allow this document to stand by itself without having to rely on anything else yeah you don't so, know pass it on and who's gonna you know what mm -hmm. what assistant's gonna mm -hmm. pass it to his mate or mm -hmm. you know yeah, if they really like it, they might pass, go, oh, this is this great project and they pass it to whoever. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly like, what the hell am I looking at? What's the mm -hmm. story? It's just like bang into this kind of like essay. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where I got to. So we open now with the log line. Actually, it's more of a log line. It's a one paragraph. I'm still not, I don't love center just justified text because mm -hmm. uh, I think eye scan makes it harder to read. Something that you'll see throughout is I've used different weighting on keywords and stuff like that to draw attention to it, even in a subtle way, like the fact that it's an all female crew. Put this up ahead. So when uh, you go to this page, which I've largely kept because I couldn't think of a better way to show the small d diversity of the cast than a montage page that maybe, you know, this might have need to be underlined. Um, you know, Do, and then the images on that. Uh that montage page, do they represent one character or is this just a broad sense? It's this like is the broad a feel sense for the crew. crew. Yeah. A feel for the crew. Cause it's it, different ages, everything yeah, from 16 yeah. to like 70, right? But Without uh, locking us into a particular character design. But, but there aren't 12 characters on there. Or there's like eight or nine, I think. Yeah, there's, there's not there. like, not each one of these is not a specific character. Because that may be something that you do, that you that you really think hard about which image mm. represents which characters, and then mm. th this page is very specifically mm. the crew or, mm. or the crew, you know. Yeah, and it could be that it's moved, right? Because you'll yeah. you'll see. So I've got like the like even though we got the log line, like this mm -hmm. is like the hook page, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Into the creative vision, broken up, bigger text, so it's it's mm -hmm. less dense. Uh, good orphan there, Willis. That should go up there. <laughs> uh, as you can see, I've kept a lot of the same imagery. Um, I've now started pulling out pull quotes, right? So even if you flip through it, they hopefully grab your attention. What does it mean to be human? You know, yeah. again, this is one of those great concept art pieces that you can see that they've worked off a photographic base. They probably had a model stand for them because I can't, I look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, that's painted. But on the Zoom does not really look painted. So Stu did all this work this morning and I haven't seen it. And that is so much cooler than what we had before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. I want that to be the reaction, right? An image um, is specific to that little um, blurb there, you know, how far are they willing to go to protect themselves and their freedom? Like that image says that, you know. Hmm. Um, I see right. about to compromise their own morals, you know, in that image and, uh, or compromise their own code or, or you know. Yeah. And I code. don't know if that really works, this highlight down here. And I could have used like a call out box, you know, trust is difficult to prepare and print out. It sets mm -hmm. in like dry, right? Maybe it should have just been that that's mm -hmm. bold, not that, you know, it's just about where your eye is quickly scanning. Mm -hmm. um, I letterbox this image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
to, to remind them that's cinematic. And again, you can see that it's painted, but man, it looks so yeah. photographic. Like, yeah. I'd have to look up the artist. It's such a good job, you know, and a real minimalist page. Don't know if it completely works, but that's what the characters are. A team of violent yeah. loners, right? Yeah. Oh, so much better. You know, <laughs> single yeah. images. And then yeah. all the images that I had, I just pulled the ones that I really liked. Yeah. And you haven't added to overall page length. So I don't know what you've been cutting, but. Oh, I have yeah. a little. Mm. Um, but you also notice the color, like the color transitions part of it. Um, you know, that goes into that, which is yeah. an image that you responded to. And it was an interesting discussion we had because I was like, oh, it makes it go too much serenity. And you're like, that's not a bad thing. Don't hide from the, the comp, you know? He's like, Mark was like, this feels like it's a fi- it could be a, a frame from the film. So include it. And, and I mean, a whole other generation has come up since Serenity, you know. So it's like you, you really, you're really selling to a new generation. You know? Yeah. So. You know, and I've now put the headings on like pages like that yeah. to break it up. Yeah. Don't know if this little section visually flows, like maybe that text here should have been brought up so your eye scan doesn't pop. So eye scan refers to where your eye is looking on the page. So here my eye is in the middle. I go to this page and now my eye has to move to the top. So it feels more abrupt. So I could have potentially moved that above. Um, but that's what you mean about the pull quotes, right? Your suggestion is I had this page blank. You're like, oh, just a little bit of something, something, right? Yeah. You know, her body, it reads alone. Her body is a something with the stories of her and her crew, you know? And then we go into, I'm not sure if this is as effective. Uh, you can see I was running out of time. I was trying to get <laughs> this ready. Um, and I transition into a black background as well. So it's for the denser text, it's white. And then it gets into the more cinematic look stuff. And the decision I made, I ended up going, oh, black feels better because it makes the lighting and the color feel stronger. Yeah. This ties to the biophilic design, neglected and overrun. So I picked this image and I would have, if I had time, I would have Photoshopped a little bit. I would have added a gradient to make this little bit work, but it kind of works. I reduced one of the pages because you went, oh, there's too much design, like one too many pages on the, on the filic, you know, and one strong image here, you know, maybe that's not the right phrase to highlight because it's about domestic life in an unlikely environment. So maybe that should have been, you know, better worded to go with the fact that they've got a hammock on a spaceship, which is cool. Mm. Like it's a cool piece of concept art. And your observation was that concept art works with, stuff that's more designy because we're used mm. to seeing it, right? But when you're opening up with stuff, use photographic images. When you're talking about like plot, so Mark, just not to speak for you, but your feedback to us was that you felt like you preferred cinematic images when you're talking about plot and characters and to reserve concept art for, as she said, more design at, like, and world and that kind yeah. of stuff. I think especially with a science fiction piece uh yeah reserve you use that stuff extensively in the world or in the production design section i mean sometimes those two sections are interchangeable really yeah and as i said like some of the layout i would still tweak but this is the kind of the concept i was going with like pulling out like no windows no escape you know connecting to claustrophobia yeah. but it, maybe claustrophobia is it's on its own line this feels like it's something that i'm would still refine consolidated some of those images yeah. Again, another photographic image, specifically when talking about the cinematographical approach, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, that works. You know, a page like this, goal is to make the audience feel intensely, mm-hmm. you know? And then suddenly like a little buffer like this, which is about the bioluminescent mm-hmm. lighting idea. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it feels fine being on a page by itself because it's only one yeah. page. It's not like three pages without text. Um. And I picked that image because it transitions, the color connects, mm. you know? So it works aspect ratio wise, but connects into that. And then action and violence, you know? And, you know, if that's all you read from the page and act, action and violence will be up close in your face and intimate. You're like, okay, I get that when we get here, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you may want to replace the, the first action and violence image with a, a photograph, like one key mm. photographic image, mm. you know? Yeah. Even one- Maybe, maybe it's one of these images that you... Yeah, it could be that this image itself, which again is an iconic Serenity image, but you could take that, replace, put that there, and then, 
you know, and that, that that's the end. Action and violence is something that you're dealing with with actors and, and with real de- depictions of reality. So you probably want to. Especially when you're saying you want, like, the, your approach to the violence is grounded and intimate. Yeah, that's right. That's a good observation. I'm actually kind of making it cartoony. It's literally <laughs> counterpointing the text. We're going to be up close, in your face, real. Here's some concept art. You know? uh, as opposed to, like, it, it feels like you can get away with that there. Yeah, you can take a shot from, like, Edge of Tomorrow or something like that. Like, it, like an extreme close-up of Emily Blunt. You know, it's, you can't contextualize it too much in that film but just something to show movement and, you know like you know i think obscure images kind of really help you know especially when they are in those sections between sections yeah you know, they give you a sense but they don't point to something too specific and they'll let you kind of dwell on you know yeah like that that red image is, is great yeah. um so i think a few things to to note when we're working on this lookbook. We talked about this idea of visual language and visual development. We're kind of reconfiguring, Chaz and I are reconfiguring mm. this to be a little bit more steampunk, right? Because mm. part of doing the lookbook was like, this is now beginning to feel like at the time we're working on it, we're not the only people working on the trend towards kind of like neon colors and stuff like mm. that, right? That's why we're pulling out the image. It's becoming mm. more those images are becoming more popular, but it feels like, oh, we've kind of beginning a lot of this design language in sci-fi, yeah. except the kind of the biophilic organic stuff that mm-hmm. felt to us really um, fresh. That kind of came from production design that we were working with. And then we rolled it into the script to the point mm-hmm. now we're like, oh, we'll do a steampunky <laughs> version of this. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Which would include some of it, but which would mm-hmm. effectively have all, more the a little bit of that that matte feel, mm-hmm. but more like not typical 14th century, but uh, uh, 14th century, 18th century. 18th century, yeah. But it's interesting how doing a lookbook helps you go. How mm. fresh does this feel visually? And for a, a, a genre that is so about its visuals, like yet another sci-fi film that looks a little bit like Alien. Mm. Right, and that's part of it. The early, I don't, I didn't, you know. Obviously, that's version seven. That's version six. The earlier lookbooks was like, oh wow. When I did it as a director, it was like a lot of our design language feels straight out of Alien, you know, because it's cool. Like Alien's a great film; it's iconic, you know. But then we were like, ah, oh, what if we go trying to find something else? And then we mm. came up with this idea that they have to grow their own food and hydroponics. And what if they don't give a fuck? Um, so there's just like mushrooms and I think we mm. even wrote a scene where like someone plucks something from the wall in the corridor you know and eats it you know and, but it kind of informed the writing process a little bit so I want to encourage people to see that building up these kind of like libraries even if you're not um, super visual will help inform that aspect of your work right yeah. um, and just to point out all of that was done in pages right and that because for those who haven't used it, it's got a page layout function. So it's really easy to create like text blocks because you want to create a box with the text and move images around and crop images and scale them up. I mean, this is not going to be a tutorial on using pages, but if you're a Mac user, it is free and it is really good for doing this stuff pretty easily. It is possible to do it in Word, but it's a nightmare. Yeah, if, you were, if you're in office land, um, actually PowerPoint is better at doing this stuff than, um, than Word. Yeah, totally. Totally. There's even a few free, I don't know what they're called anymore. Adobe had one on the iPad, uh, like a layout, uh, free layout. Um, it worked a lot like Pages. I don't know what it's mm-hmm. called now, but, um, or even if it even exists. It, oh, look- that, they, it's Adobe. They release software, <laughs> lose interest, <laughs> cancel it. <laughs> right. Very annoying. But they, yeah, they, you might want to work on your iPad, you know, because it's just mm. easy to drag and stuff. But, so I think one of the, the things that I always take is there will be a certain stage of the process that I will start collating visual images, right? And that could be, and I think that's worth doing if you're a writer, you know, just have a folder, stumble across stuff, stick it in a folder, stick it in a folder, stick it in a folder. You know, the bigger, the, the more reference imagery you have, the easier it is going to be to build this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and there's, a, there's another great couple of resources. One's called the Everett Collection. Um, which everybody should get onto. Um, and the other one is called Shot Deck. Um, oh. amongst 
websites that you're able to pull, pull images from. Shot Deck is incredible because of its search engine. Like you can search for specific actors or, or um, specific genres or moments in a film. Uh, you can even search by production design. Um, so it's very helpful. Something that I also try to do is, you know, because movies are one thing and movies are very referential, but if you want to step outside of that, um, it's often great to look at commercials and music videos because that's where most people won't be looking to get their references from. So you'll get unique stuff. Uh, you know, say, say you want a, a shot of somebody being held up at an ATM. The, 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 the temptation is to just Google, Google that and then get all these generic um, editorial shots or semi, um, you know, stage shots with horrible lighting. But the, the trick is to really get your stuff to, to be cinematic and, and, and sometimes that mm. requires you to think outside the box, look at websites of directors, cinematographers, of colorists, of um, editors, colorists. you know, and yeah. yeah, colorists especially because all of their stuff is going to look glossy and kind of probably have an aesthetic that you, that you want. Um, you know, if there's a certain location you're looking for, go and go and look at a tourism campaign mm -hmm. that location you know because the chances are they shot something and then and then obviously that's, that's good advice jazz for our final queensland project yeah. <laughs> well there you go you know i mean no one's ever going to shoot that location better than in those campaigns mm. and then you know also look at documentaries i mean documentaries are, are are being shot with more cinematic value these days than ever um and it's easier to pull shots from netflix uh, from stuff on Netflix, you know, use Google Chrome if you're if you're looking at streaming stuff because for some reason Safari doesn't let you do um, screenshots from from Netflix. DRM, they they respect DRM. It's very Apple. <laughs> Chrome yeah. doesn't. It's Google. And good on them, you know. <laughs> um, you know, and then that kind of brings us into this idea of ripomatics, which I've I've never created a ripomatic myself. I've only overseen them, but uh, when you're did you guys want to talk about that now quickly or i mean it's either so we've got two options right now um is in terms of last things we could one of our listeners and former guests uh mel killingsworth has got a lookbook for her show that we could just all look at with fresh eyes um and critique uh, she's being very brave on that front but or we could just sort of uh wind our way out of this concluding with thoughts on other sales documents because we've really just looked at pitch decks and lookbooks which i think for our listenership is the main thing that people should be thinking about but mark i don't know if you had to engage in this huge tsunami of development funding rounds that happened in australia since covid hit but nearly every single one now requires a one to four minute pitch video yeah. and so those have been like a sort of i know a lot of listeners and and friends of mine who've been having to do those, it's just been a nightmare. Like all of us have been able to go and shoot them on our phones and do them ourselves. It's not been like a technological thing, but it's just not a skill set that we were inherently comfortable with yeah. doing. I mean, even Stu as a director, like the the Imagine Impact one um, was what, Stu, I'm just talking briefly about the 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 pitch videos we had to do for all those development runs rounds and the uh, imagine impact one was that one 30 seconds long yeah hi my name is okay <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. so i was just saying Stuart, either we could go into mel's lookbook to wrap up or we could talk about like other ancillary materials or both depending how much time everyone has what do you guys feel i'm i'm easy you're the one with children mm -hmm. you too I think I think we can actually hit Mel's pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I can give us Let's some broad things, and then because uh, I think it's really useful because she's been kind enough, her and her co-writer uh, Justin, being kind enough to share a lookbook that's in development. Mm -hmm. um, so we can give them some live feedback, uh, and then hope, I mean maybe we can do a follow up, see what it is, and then yeah, we can talk about some kind of broader things after that. All right, I'm going to share it off my other machine. You're brave, Mel. And to be clear, this isn't a pitch deck. This is a lookbook. So she's sat, while she is no, a writer yeah. and creator, she's, this document is to sell her as the director as well as the 
writer and creator. Okay. All right. So I uh, love a good stencil font. Um, so let's, uh, how about Chaz and I, and we'll, we'll talk through our reactions uh, and then Mark can as well. Mm. We'll just flick through the whole thing. So I think this mm. is a good test. It's the equivalent mm. of the squint test. So mm -hmm. for those who don't know what the squint test is, it's when looking mm. at a composition, you squint. Because essentially mm -hmm. what you're boiling it down is from the details to the silhouette, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get a sense of the shape. Mm -hmm. All right. So are we going to flick through it first? Oh, yeah. I just did. Oh, okay. All right. I mean, just visually... I'm getting knocked back by the gray boxes. Yeah. Like I would prefer it fading into the background a bit more with like the text standing out more, but that's just. No, no, no. I think like every, it's all feedback is like, <laughs> this is so weird giving live feedback, right? All feedback is legitimate, right? So yeah. this is my reaction to it. And this is how I feel. So. I know, like that it's short. <laughs> Um, a couple of observations that I will make, <clears throat> and this is me getting into full designer mode. <laughs> that kerning needs work. The fact is it reads it like stay at home hitman, right? You need more spacing. And generally on most applications, that's option left and right on the arrow keys will let you uh, adjust the, the kerning, not the letting, the kerning uh, between letters. And so I would, I would break that up to make it easier to read. I mean, this is me giving, that's really my new detail. But on the first page, that's my reaction. I mean, I, in other words, I would, this is like a good example of what's a title treatment thing. I would consider setting, sending that logo design as reference to a designer and say, hey, can you come up with something that's a little bit more bespoke? Maybe they'll do something with explosions or whatever. But we know from The Sopranos and Breaking Bad and all that shit that just a title treatment can sell your show, you know, as in it, it's part of the branding. Yeah. I, I would finance this show because someone named Killingsworth <laughs> Mel was like, great, can I pitch it to you? <laughs> can I, like, this is me as a, as a word person, much more than obviously than a visual person, but I would consider either doing it in title font, like um, separating the word stay at home from Hitman, or even if you have it all with the same font is hyphenating stay at home because they're almost like, they're the two contrasting conflicting ideas right like that's oh, okay yeah you know, it's yeah. the fact that it's a hitman who's a stay at home hitman there's oh, a right. version of this that you could do that's two lines where hitman's really big yeah. and it's the yeah. same block as stay at home and then hitman underneath mm. and it's effectively mm. like a single block yeah and i don't like if you don't want to hyphenate like stay at home as if it's like one word fine but that's what i'm saying is like in some way separate visually the ideas of stay at home and hitman To, I, I would go with two separate lines, even perhaps two separate colors. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to make it cheesy, but yeah, two lines I think would definitely do the trick on the hyphen. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, next page. Yeah. Stay at and, and I mean, that is, I know there's a white cast on that image, um, but what might be nicer is actually just making the opacity normal and moving the logo, the, the series logo, to justify it to the right. So it's in that negative space outside of the guy's body on the right, mm -hmm. in the right third. Um, and then, you know, and then making it a bit smaller because that would give it a bit of an interesting an interesting look. So effectively, I mean, this is getting very designy feedback, mm -hmm. but yeah, you could, have, you could use a gradient to create that separation. So you got the full photographic image kind of bleeding into where the text is, is kind of what you're talking about. Because one thing, thing you, you did that I, you take advantage of the out of focus areas to place text is kind of what you're saying, yeah? yeah. And you can enhance that. Yeah, it always looks more beautiful for sure. I mean, one of the things that I thought worked with Mark's feedback on Hollow Code and seeing what you did, Mark, in, in Black Gold is I know like Mel's obviously kept only to a few pages here, but I would much rather like a hook or a log line, like for that first page is not a big lot of, yeah. like not three paragraphs of text is like, just give me the one, yeah. the one sentence, whether it's a premise, whether it's a concept, whether it's a hook, whether it's a log line, whatever it is, but like tagline. Yeah. Yeah. And, and put it, put it, in, 
put it in in the negative space of an image you know that, that really sells it you know that first image is great i'd find another one similar to that hook the hook in the negative i mean space. if you can th what this image does really well is i think like the it looks like it's from barry i think but it um is the casualness of the shirt that he's wearing and that's what you're going for but what i saw later when you scan through the document is some of those like yeah like the dad with the baby carrier and like some of the other like from the let down like sleepless nights and things like that so if the second image wasn't rather the same one but one doing the leaning slightly more to the family stuff as well like these are the two conflicting worlds anyway i mean you, you want to give those that imagery more space to breathe as well and that makes it make well, I think the feedback that you gave to me, just jumping on this, all of this stuff, break it onto individual pages, structure and format, target audience, style. You know, they can all afford to be their own pages and it means you get rid of the busyness, right? These background images here kind of, to me, feel like they're uh, just making it, like this page has got a lot. It's just a lot. Get rid of the background image, totally. Yeah, so you can get rid of the image. I personally wouldn't use... I would use this font for the title and that's it. Yeah. You know, something that's similar, like a, a, but the fact is the kind of stencil thing at smaller details starts getting difficult to kind of pass um, and adds to the business, you know, because you you're literally breaking up the silhouette. That centered justification on that synopsis page, of, or I don't know why um, that is there. But can I just say, like, if can, can you go forward one page that this page, those two images on the top right hand corner, they tell so much about what this story is. Like, I haven't read any of the text in here. I've only read like I, I Mel has pitched the project to us before. So I've got some idea, but I know from stay at home hitman and I've got these two pictures of a dad like cradling a baby and then like a man with a gun running down a suburban street like that is the show. And, and, and coming back to Mark's lookbook, just put them on two, like the, the stay at home at the dad and then the gun at the bottom or the gun at the top and the, the you know, what is the story? Is it about he's a stay at home dad and he's a hitman or he's a hitman who's also a dad, you know? But I think rather than overlapping them, lay, mm -hmm. laying them over at the top mm -hmm. and just have it on structure and format, you know? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. find images that speak to target audience. That could be comps, posters, fake poster, you know, style. Um, I think that can work really, really well. And I personally, I mean, this is a personal thing. I'm not a huge fan of background images like that mm -hmm. just because they add kind of squint test starts being like the reason you're doing this gray background is because it won't, the text won't sit over the background that you've got. Therefore get rid of the background and get rid of the gray box. Yeah. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Like you, you, you're creating a solution to a problem that you don't need to even have, right? Personally, or just defocus that a lot. But then in, at the same time, I just don't know if you need it. I think plain colors work for a reason. Um, and again, with the characters coming back to what Mark showed us, why not just do a page for Harrison, Harry, a mm -hmm. couple of mm -hmm. cool images of him, and then one page for Kim Pham, one or two images here. You can potentially use this background image here about the family as a breaker, you know, mm -hmm. in the same way that I was trying to do with the holocode thing where it's like a breaker and like a line or a sentence that says something about the characters. Yeah. I mean, that said, I liked when Mark had both the lead characters of his show in the oh, same yeah. one because it was about the marriage. But here it feels like really the conflictual relationship is actually between the dad and the baby. So it would be instead of like, you know, you could have Harrison and his daughter who's a baby and like all the pain in the ass that his like, having a, a character page for a baby or a character description for a baby, I find like quite a humorous idea. Cause you're basically just saying how they ruin the parent's life is their character description. It's speaking yeah. from experience, Chaz. Huh? <laughs> Probably just call it characters, you know, not yeah. take out the descriptions and center that, you know, that heading so that it just feels a bit more balanced on the page. Mm -hmm. Is Mel and crying yet? <laughs> one thing I do is I put the heading on, on, on one page. I put the characters on one page, but I don't. If I, if the next page is still char the character section continued, I don't repeat that, it. that heading. I mean, again, visually, she's got two blue pictures that really stick out not well against all the sort of more beige, 
yeah. brown, yellow colors. So there's that previous screenshot from Barry and now the, the Killing Eve one that they just really stick out. And I mean, I could kind of see like, maybe you're saying during the day he's a dad and during the night he's a hitman, but I think that would need to uh, play out a bit. You need to do that more clearer because otherwise these are the only two images in the whole thing that disrupt that um, that visual consistency. Yeah. Like if you're going to do the two worlds thing with different color tones, mm. grade this one to be blue, mm. you know? Like if it's going to be, if you're going to do something with the color palette and color, like um, oh, I'm not analogous, contrasting colors for lack of a better word. There's a bit better, more technical term, like opposite colors on the color wheel, you know, grade these to be warmer. You know, it's the, it's the orange and teal thing. Grade them, grade the family to be orange and then that to be teal. And you can make that as a, a dis designing palette. And that could be reflected in your title design here, you know, stay at home in kind of like an orange and this in a blue, if you want, mm. might be too much. The other thing know. I would avoid is using the kind of like Getty style images, like those two character description images that, that the previous one with the dad i try to find imagery from real dramas real movies uh you know uh, cast yeah i mean it's just it's just less kind of photographic um catalogy images because really you want to give people a sense that you know like the better course all image is great because it's it just has emotion to it it has emotion and it has tone and it's lit a certain way and you want to you want to be a, be able to you know, even if you're not a director, sell the producers on on the fact that they can entice a director, they can entice a, a great filmmaker to this, and and that's going to be in how you present it. You know, in your, in your, in your choice of imagery. All right. So, shall I try to summarize? See if there's like, because I think we can use this to bridge into some like learnings that we may have had. You know. Um, make this more make the title more decipherable and more reflective of the inherent co comedic uh contrast less busy pages will make it easy means that it'll make it easy to make your content start stand out related to the busyness is the kind of consistency of the color palette kind of bring stuff either closer together or if there's a deliberate style choice and that there's the two worlds in the same way that the matrix has got the green world and the blue world you know this is about the the warmth the yellows of family and the kind of bluey purples of the hitman world kind of bring that out in your design choices um use more cinematic imagery rather than stock photos and i like your observation because the fact is stock photos have been designed and been shot to kind of be neutral right that's what they they're there so you can use them in anything and the fact is have a point of view with the, the the shots that you choose and so something like better call saul or killing eve works better because they have a point of view mm. um and anything else that's kind of like feels like a summary of that i mean i wouldn't use mm. this this is this kind of stencil font is a what we call a decorative font and i don't think you can really use it for hittings beyond the opening title but you can have something in the style of it mm -hmm. Uh, that kind of reflects the the language, which is it's a sans serif font mm. that you you, um, which is kind of like quite vertical. You could even just take Helvetica and kind of stretch it by one twenty percent, you know, or one thirty to kind of make it feel within that ballpark, but not as because you can see how like the lines break up, make it harder to kind of pass. I don't think you necessarily need that. Very Anything good. else? That's all from me. Cool. Should we try to, um, <laughs> what I was trying to do is like transition us into kind of like any learnings. I'm interested, particularly in you, Chaz, because yeah. you're the one who's coming to it as a writer. A noob. <laughs> a noob. Yeah. Uh, look, it's, it's inspired me to actually, so I've got a, I've got a TV project that we actually looked at in our unfilmables episode that is with a producer and, we've put together so many funding applications that we've got so many materials that I think it would be quite easy to put together one of these pitch decks that would pitch it better than what we have. Just um, text. Yeah. Um, I, so I'm tempted potentially just to, you know, doodle away for a few hours um, getting it done. I think one of the big learnings I've taken from this is just to not be scared of it, um, how accessible and relatively straightforward it can be. I think we've all got instincts, you know, we're writing for a visual medium, like no matter how text-based we are, 
we know when something feels like what we want it to feel like. And, and you know movies. I mean, that you're in you're in this because you you love movies. So mm. your first instinct is actually visual more more than uh, more than writing. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, listeners will know that the con part of the concept is it's a TV show about a, a kids book author who's got writer's block, and so she's drawing like uh, she's illustrating like drawing kids book animals but they're expressing her psyche. So they're like swearing back at her. So I think I would probably get a concept artist to actually mock up one of those jokes and then potentially try and Photoshop it into like a picture of an artist, like over their shoulder drawing it kind of thing. So people get a, an, a real idea for how that works. Um, but yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and that the point of like finding specific, stuff that will work to fit your idea in your case an illustration is almost you know essential because you 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 know that's part of the concept yeah yeah and ultimately i think so Stu, i know that like i was reading his written materials for hollow code and commenting on those before he turned them into a lookbook and it's amazing just seeing like when you're seeing it in the lookbook how much of that material just doesn't need to be said anymore like not to criticize your words Stu, it's just like sometimes two sentences does just as much as two paragraphs when it's in the context of all the imagery and, and design work that, that you can do it for. So those are my key learnings. What about you, Mark? Is there anything that you kind of inspired you on this that kind of when you do? Yeah, the little tools that you, that you gave me, but I think, um, I think just knowing that there's a, there's definitely a need. I mean, that was why I put the post out on Facebook in, in the first place is just, to do exactly this, like give give people a bit of advice and, and give them a run through on, because there isn't there isn't any bible of, out there for how to pitch really. Like um, there's there's aspects of it. There's there's how to be in a room with an executive, but really, if you have a good deck, you can get ahead of that. So I think just being able to help people and, and knowing that there's a desire out there to um, to learn more about how to pitch, you know, as we're all learning. Um, is, is really healthy and good and you, you guys have certainly given me some new tools as well <laughs> um just before we go I've got, we've got a question from uh on youtube would you copyright a pitch deck how do you protect your idea if sending it out and like i guess let me preface this by you know Stu and i have law degrees but are, uh, are not copyright lawyers and and all that kind of disclaimer and all that kind of advice but at the end of the day there's no version of pitch material that is kind of copy writable because it is the idea, right? You're not looking to like copyright is the, the intellectual property protection that's vested in not the idea, but the, the expression of the words on the page. And what you're wanting to protect is actually the expression of the words in the screenplay or, you know, pilot script, not the expression of the words that are in the, uh, pitch deck right and there is no copyright in an idea and so there is no protection around this the only protection you're going to have is that it's going to you're going to have to nail this so well that anyone else will go oh that's a great idea and i can't do it as well or as uniquely as the person who has just sent me this material i agree <laughs> <laughs> i mean you certainly protect the text registering it you know to an extent but ultimately it depends how specific your idea is you know um, if your idea is about a kid who is born and grows up in, in the hollow of a tree i mean that's pretty specific but um if it's if it's a take on crime dostoevsky's crime and punishment i mean you're not going to be able to copyright that so it's it, it just depends what it is but ultimately everybody has to take that risk of, of when you send material out no. Yeah, the easiest way to protect your idea is to not share it yeah. <laughs> and therefore it will never get made. A um, couple of things before we completely, completely wrap up. One I want to point out in terms of the concept image and working with, um, sorry, the doggies, the doggies come in. So it's a bit background noise is that you can work with designers to do what, you know, photo comps. So this is a designer I've worked with on a few things, Lisa. Um, and so this is like a comp from multiple images 
to kind of represent the idea. So it's not concept art per se, but it is a composite. And, and so she'll do this as part of a pitch deck as a hero image where you need one page that really sells the idea, but you don't necessarily want to go down the, the path of doing a full piece of concept art, but it can be something that's kind of combined, bashed together from multiple um, elements. And you can do that stuff yourself. So don't be afraid to Photoshop stuff uh you know whether it's replacing police you saw one of the holocaust says police and there's other star wars all that stuff you can make kind of more specific um and i guess the kind of you know the the, the, the kind of top five <clears throat> top five five tips i've kind of taken away with less is more that's the main thing right having be you know if you're not a comfortable designer just rely on your taste mm. um as in you know picking good images that suit your material and making them do the images, whether they're against black or white, that will do good, well images, well chosen will do more than anything else. Right. And it doesn't have to be a mountain of stuff. Like the stranger things one was what, like eight images. Yeah. And then just that fake page treatment um, was just the same thing on every page, you know, uh, and the pitch is the pitch, you know, don't fight against it. <laughs> right. Are we done? Is I think so. Um, should we just thank our wonderful patrons for bringing this to you guys? Um, you know, if you enjoy Draft Zero and want more Draft Zero more often, please go to our Patreon page and support us. Um, thank you to our super awesomest patrons. Um, I will have to dig up your open, <laughs> find the link to to get you guys to be named. But while I'm fighting around with that. Um, just letting you know that Stu and I are back in lockdown again. So hoping to do, uh, we've been absent for a little while because we've actually been writing, which I hopefully all our listeners are supportive of us being absent so that we're doing writing. But the um, but now that we're back in lockdown, hopefully the plan is to do um, three, we're hoping, we're told by our government that it will may only be six weeks of lockdown. Things are looking a bit grim right now, maybe more. So we're planning one a fortnight so that we can balance um, writing and doing these. Um, and so we can hopefully get another couple out. So please spread the word uh, if you enjoy it and uh, we'll have a few more um, coming up soon. Yeah. And uh Many thanks to Mark Fermi for joining us. Please watch his feature Terminus, his web series Event Zero. Should they watch the Errol Flynn biopic that you wrote on? Um. <laughs> <laughs> they should watch a watch to that. Uh, follow his work at Resistor, Resistor Films. Um, uh, thanks so much for coming and sharing your experience. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Oh, Have dear. you found the page yet, Chaz? Oh, it's asking me to verify because I haven't logged in through fucking... Um, Firefox Web. before. Ah, oh, do you need me to do it? Yeah. Ah, oh, Chaz, 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 Chaz. It's probably going to do the same thing. Can you please verify your? <laughs> uh, no. <clears throat> wow, this is awkward. Oh, Nigel's <laughs> listening. <laughs> hey, Nigel. Ah, <laughs> oh, glad it was awesome. That's good. Well, while we're trying to wrap up, if you've got any last minute questions, now your chance. <laughs> All right, all tears, ten dollars. <laughs> Still active. All right, <laughs> you can correct my butchered pronunciation. All right, many thanks to Matteo, Christopher Walker, Sandra Willis, Theus, uh, Bergstrom, Jack Smith, and Crab Evans. Uh, thanks to all the patrons that have supported us, continued to support us. We are sad to see some of you have gone, but the world is crazy. So thank you for all your support. Uh, if you'd like to see more Draft Zero more often, please check out our Patreon uh, link in our bio, just draft-zero.com. Uh, thanks for everyone who joined us on the live stream. You guys are awesome. I hope it was useful. And again, many thanks to Mark for being awesome and sharing his experience. Thank you. And thank you particularly to Mel for being so brave to let us criticize her work <laughs> live on YouTube. Sorry, guys, that kerning is at least a couple of pixels short. Uh, and thanks for Stu for handing out his phone number live on air. I'll answer anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I'll All right. <laughs>
Oh, yeah, I got okay. I got to hit stop, don't I? Let me remember how to do this thing. All right. Uh, Bye, everyone.